Good morning. It's Monday, the 3rd of February. You're tuned in to our 10 a.m. newscast coming to you from Arirang's news center in Seoul. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. Japan is stepping up attempts to whitewash its history, but recent events in uh, Europe and the U.S. have been rebuffed. Tokyo also appears to have failed to put the brakes on a pending bill in the U.S. state of Virginia to also use the Korean name for the body of water between Korea and Japan. Korean regulators will order three leading credit card companies to suspend business operations for three months from February 17th after the biggest personal data leak in Korea's history. Plus, anti-government protests partially interrupt Sunday's general elections in Thailand, but with strong support from unaffected regions in battle, Prime Minister Ng Lak Shinawat's party is expected to win. Japan is engaging in a meticulous scheme to stop the U.S. state of Virginia from using the Korean name East Sea, as well as Japan's name Sea of Japan, when referring to the body of water between Korea and Japan. Tokyo has signed a deal with a major lobbying firm to pile the pressure on Virginia, which last week passed a bill that requires school textbooks in the state to also use the Korean name. Yulian starts us off. This is a service contract between McGuire Woods, one of the biggest lobbying firms in the United States, and the Japanese embassy in the U.S. The contract contains various ways to stop Virginia's General Assembly from passing a bill that would allow textbooks to note the Sea of Japan is also called EC. The bill, which was passed last Thursday, is important to the large Korean-American community in Virginia, who see the current sole designation of the body of water between Korea and Japan as Sea of Japan as a painful relic of Japanese occupation back in the first half of the 20th century. The contract includes ways to explain why calling the body of water EC is wrong and also plan to form protests against the Korean-American community calling for the adoption of the new title. The contract also included ways to make the new governor of Virginia, Terry McAuliffe, veto the bill if it did pass the General Assembly. The documents actually revealed that Japan's ambassador, Kenichiro Sasae, had already sent a letter to McAuliffe in December threatening that economic ties between Japan and Virginia will be damaged if the bill was enacted. It's highly unusual for a foreign embassy to be actively involved in a local state's legislation, so the findings are expected to cause quite a stir. Despite the Japanese embassy's efforts that cost them 75,000 U.S. dollars over the span of three months, the bill was passed last week by a House Education Subcommittee and it now heads to the full House Education Committee. Chairman of the Republican Party of Virginia, Pat Mullen, says his party supports the bill, adding that all students in Virginia should have a thorough understanding of problems in the world. Yurian, Arirang News. And Japan is failing to impart its rather questionable historical agenda on other parts of the world, too. The Japanese government has expressed its regret over a Korean exhibition at an international comic book festival in France that features the stories of Asian women forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese military during World War II. Japan's ambassador to France, Yoichi Suzuki, said over the weekend that the exhibit promotes a mistaken point of view that complicates relations between Korea and Japan. Uh, over in the U.S., Congressman Ed Royce visited a memorial last Friday for the so-called Comfort Women in Glendale, California. As the first U.S. congressman to pay respects at the memorial, Royce said the war crimes committed by Japan are part of history that should be taught in U.S. schools. And in a move almost certain to further inflame tensions in Northeast Asia, a top Chinese military official says a Japanese fighter jet recently entered China's air defense identification zone. Citing an interview with Major General Lo Wian, the Oriental Daily News reported Sunday that a Japanese fighter jet entered China's defense zone last Friday the first day of the Lunar New Year. Two Chinese fighters later drove the Japanese fighter out of the zone. 
The military official said the move shows Japan's intention to create a problem and proves that it's Tokyo raising tensions in East Asia. He added Beijing's prompt announcement shows China is prepared for combat even during the country's festive period. South Korea and the United States have signed a new agreement on sharing the costs of keeping U.S. troops on the Korean Peninsula from 2014 to 2018. Foreign Minister Yoon byung se and U.S. Ambassador to Seoul Song Kim signed the renewed special measures agreement on Sunday. The pact still needs to be approved by Korea's National Assembly, something that could prove difficult as lawmakers have criticized the sharp increase of the cost shouldered by Seoul. Under the new pact, South Korea will pay some 860 million U.S. dollars in 2014, up nearly 6 percent from 2013. Korea's National Assembly is set to open a month-long extraordinary session later on this Monday, four months before the first local elections under the Park Geun-hye administration will be held in June. Things are hotting up not only on the election front, but on the legislative front as well. Kim Yeon-ji reports. The pre-registration of candidates for the June 4th local elections begins this Tuesday. And when the bell rings, the rival parties will start their four-month-long race to the line. Preliminary candidate registration will continue until May 14th. And those who choose to register during this period are allowed to start campaigning ahead of the main candidate registration in mid-May. The June elections cover 17 provincial governor and mayoral seats, as well as education superintendents and local assembly members. The ruling Sinori Party and the main opposition Democratic Party are quickening steps to name candidates for the nationwide polls, and they plan to finalize their nominations by April. Independent lawmaker Anter Su is also aiming to launch his own party by March and field candidates for all 17 provincial governor and mayoral seats. With the addition of Ahn's party, the June local elections are expected to be a three-way race for the first time in 16 years. Ahead of the elections, the rival parties are expected to lock horns on a range of issues in Parliament this month. Lawmakers will launch a probe into the massive personal data leak last month involving three credit card companies. But the rival parties are wide apart on how to handle the crisis. The ruling Senate Party is focusing on penalizing financial institutions by imposing fines on them if they are found to have leaked their customers' personal data. But the main opposition Democratic Party wants to adopt a compensation system focusing more on having financial institutions pay for the damage incurred by data losses. The Democratic Party is also demanding Finance Minister Hyun Woo-seok, as well as the heads of the nation's financial regulators, step down to take responsibility for the data leak. But the Senate Party says handling the crisis must be their top priority. The rival parties are also locking horns over the government's basic old-age pension plan, with the opposition party adamant about sticking to President Park's original pledge to pay all senior citizens 200,000 won, or about 185 U.S. dollars, every month. Kim Hyun-ji, Arirang News. Korea's debt-ridden public institutions have vowed to reduce their debts further by 37 billion U.S. dollars by the year 2017. The finance ministry says 18 public entities, including the Korea Land and Housing Corporation and the Korea Electric Power Corporation, plan to attract private capital and delay launching of several projects to slash their liabilities. Through the initiatives, the public firms would nearly double their previously pledged debt reduction and bring down their debt ratio by almost 20 percentage points. Some 40 public institutions also say they will reduce employee benefits by 150 million U.S. dollars this year. Based on the finalized plan to be announced later this month, the government will assess the firm's progress in June and at the end of the third quarter. Now, with the public still up in arms over the largest ever personal information leak 
Here in Korea, the government is taking more steps to prevent further damage from the data breach. Prime Minister Jong Hong Won said Sunday that law enforcement authorities will begin an indefinite crackdown on those who illegally circulate or use leaked personal data. As punishment for the leak, the country's financial regulators will notify the three credit card companies that had their customer data, data stolen. KB Gungmin Card, NH Nonghyop Card and Lotte Card that their business operations will be suspended for three months starting February 17th, last month's leak, which affected at least 20 million people, has raised concerns the data could have ended up in the hands of scammers. The head of Korea's financial regulator has raised concerns about how the U.S. central bank's latest stimulus tapering could affect the Korean economy. At a meeting with officials Sunday, Financial Services Commission Chairman Shin Jae-yoon said he doesn't expect a short-term market shock from the widely expected 10 billion U.S. dollar monthly taper. He, however, added as the bond purchase reduction takes effect, the effects could possibly be greater than expected, referring to the International Monetary Fund's request uh, for emerging economies to actively seek countermeasures. Shin said Korea needs to maintain its strong fundamentals to protect the domestic economy from surprise external shocks. Test results that will tell us whether the bird flu outbreak has spread to Korea's southeast will likely come out sometime today. This comes after a chicken farm in the southeastern port city of Busan reported a suspected case of bird flu last week and sent samples to a lab for a detailed testing. Test results from another duck farm in the central Chungcheongbukdo region may also be announced today. Meanwhile, lockdown measures at three farms, including one chicken farm in Gyeonggi-do province near Seoul, have been lifted after their samples concluded the birds did not die of the highly pathogenic H5N8 strain of bird flu. This is the first time the government has lifted a standstill ban after a duck farm in the southwestern Jolla Bukdo province was confirmed to have been affected with a bird flu on January 17th. Now, the outbreak of bird flu in the country is making some people think twice before eating chicken or duck, but a national group of doctors says there's no cause for concern and, in a show of confidence, they tucked into some delicious duck meat at a restaurant in Seoul, our Paulie reports. Here in the city of Seoul, a local restaurant specializing in roasted duck is buzzing with business, despite the outbreak of avian influenza. But it hasn't scared off this special community of doctors who say they're eager to dig in. <laughs> Organized by the Korean Academy of Family Doctors, some 100 health professionals have come out in a show of support to raise public awareness about food safety. From the perspective of health professionals, there is no problem with eating chicken and duck affected by bird flu as long as it's cooked. We came here to demonstrate that. According to relevant authorities, there have been no human cases of the H5N8 bird flu strain in Korea. However, doctors say such infections, if there were to be some, would be manageable. Avian influenza in terms of influenza strains is not a serious disease. If by chance there is an infection, antiviral drugs and similar treatments would be more than sufficient to treat it. In addition, experts say there is no evidence to suggest that eating cooked poultry can transmit the AI virus to humans. So don't worry, just cook thoroughly and eat up. Paul Yi, Arirang News. In international news, voting has ended in Thailand's general elections, but it seems the bitter political conflict and violent clashes on the streets will rumble on. Thailand's election watchdog says it's unable to announce the results after anti-government protesters forced the closure of hundreds of polling stations. Kim Minji reports. 
Thailand's much-disputed national election closed Sunday, but hundreds of polling stations in Bangkok were shut as anti-government protesters blocked access to would-be voters. Local residents lodged complaints at police stations, saying they were unable to cast their ballots. I came to vote because I want to keep the right, and it all depends on me if I want to cast an abstention vote. Voting was prevented in more than 430 of the capital's 6,600 polling stations, and there was no voting at all in at least five southern provinces. Voting elsewhere went smoothly. An anti-government protest leader said the government would not be able to declare a result due to the closures. The elections could not be held nationwide. Therefore, the government will be unable to declare a result. The election is a waste of time and money. After the polls closed, Thailand's election commission said nearly 90 percent of the country's 93-thousand polling stations were able to open. Further voting has been set for February 23rd for those who were unable to cast their ballot during the advanced voting last week due to disruptions caused by anti-government protests. The protests flared up in November last year with protesters demanding Prime Minister Yang Lakshinawat resign, accusing her of being a puppet for her brother and exiled former leader Thaksin Shinawat. They want an unelected People's Council that would oversee political reform. However, with the opposition boycotting the elections, Yang Lak is expected to win comfortably. A mass protest is being called for Monday in Bangkok, further escalating tensions in the nation. At least six people were injured Saturday in gun battles between protesters and government supporters. Kim min Arirang News. The Ukrainian government has let an opposition activist leave the country for medical treatment after his abduction, torture and then attempted arrest by police outraged the opponents of President Viktor Yanukovych, Dmitryo Bulatov, who spoke about being crucified during more than one week in the hands of mysterious kidnappers, is heading to Lithuania which has promised to treat any protesters injured in the crisis. President Yanukovych, facing mass protests that have prompted fears of a civil war even, has announced that he will turn to work on Monday after taking four days off on sick leave. Yanukovych's decision to accept the resignations last week of his prime minister and his cabinet has done little to placate demonstrators, many of whom want to see Ukraine forge closer ties with the EU rather than Russia. A court in Egypt has acquitted more than 60 supporters of former President Mohamed Morsi, who were arrested last year for holding violent protests. The men, most of whom have links to Morsi's Muslim Brotherhood, had stood accused of attempting of attempted murder rather and rioting following clashes in Cairo that left at least seven people dead and more than 250 injured. They had been protesting against Morsi's ousting by the military in July 2013. Egypt's military-backed interim government declared the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist group last year. Back here in Korea, and taxi rates in the Korean capital Seoul were raised last year in an attempt to boost the incomes of struggling drivers and to improve overall passenger services. But both drivers and passengers are still complaining that little has changed despite the fare hike. Song Jison reports. Even after four months since taxi rates were raised, it's still difficult for many commuters to catch a cab at night here in Seoul. Even after the fare hike, I spent two hours trying to hail a cab. In that time, I was turned down about three times, so it's quite frustrating. About four or five taxis told me that they couldn't take me that way even though they were empty. Taxi drivers say they're still being forced to turn down customers in order to earn a living wage. They say it's because taxi companies are requiring drivers to turn over more of their daily earnings, eating up any rise in income from the higher fares. We should be getting paid 30,000 won or about 30 US dollars more than before, but that's not the case. Drivers aren't able to be friendly to customers. The local government had sought to address taxi compliance when approving the base rate hike, which would translate to a nearly 4 percent increase in daily average income. However, a majority of taxi companies have increased the amount that cab drivers need to turn over by about $24 on top of the previous $113 daily total. 
We usually need to file 26 working days to earn a normal salary. Even though the fares have increased, making more than $130 is not very easy. In response, taxi companies say they've increased the monthly salaries of taxi drivers to reflect the higher rates and fees. But drivers say that it's not enough, which will likely leave more customers waiting on the road even longer. Song Ji-san, Arirang News. And a good Monday morning to you all as we kick things off with the South Korean national football team taking on the U.S. national team. Now, coming off of a huge 4 0 loss against Mexico, it's time for the Tegok Warriors to step it up. Now, with the match taking place in Los Angeles, Chris Wondolowski scores a double for Team USA as Korea fails to score for the second straight match. Now, with the loss, Korea is currently at four wins, six losses, and three draws under the management of Hong Young Bo. Meanwhile, the team is set to return to Korea as they hope to work out their flaws before their friendly against Greece in March. Of course, with all the media and celebrities hanging out in New York City before the big game in New Jersey, Denver Broncos quarterback and future Hall of Famer Peyton Manning won his record fifth league MVP. After receiving 49 out of 50 votes, Manning, who set a new season record for passing yards and passing touchdowns, was the clear-cut winner here as he also received the Offensive Player of the Year honors as well. The 37-year-old quarterback finished off his MVP season with over 5,400 passing yards and 55 touchdowns. And shifting over to golf, where the Omega Dubai Desert Classic took place over the weekend with Stephen Gallagher winning the event. Not the best fourth round for Gallagher, but a strong first and third round helps him finish off the four-day event, shooting a 16-under overall to finish with a one-stroke lead over Emiliano Grillo of Argentina, who shot a 66 on the last day. And despite the $2.5 million bonus for anyone who pulls off a hole-in-one at the 17th hole of the Emirates Golf Course, the challenge seemed a bit too tough. And back here in the nation, we had a couple of KBL games that took place on Sunday as the Koyang Orions beat KCC Aegis 75-62, with Anyang KGC beating Incheon Etilan Elephants 83-77. You want to take a look at the struggling one Judong Bupromi take on KT Sonic Boom. Now a high-scoring game in the first half as KT rallies back to take a 43-36 lead thanks to Song Young Jin leading the way for KT. And of course, despite Tongu's Keith Randleman tearing it up in the fourth quarter, KT never looks back as Cho Sang Min finishes off with 21 points in the game as KT takes this game 77 to 65. And now finishing things off with some Sunday's V League action, the first place IBK Altos cruise past Hungook Insurance Life Pink Spiders three sets to nothing as we move over to Hyundai Capital Skywalkers take on Korean Air Jumbos. Now the Hyundai Capital Skywalkers looking to catch up to the first place Samsung Hwaja Blue Fangs, and they get a great start here, taking the first two sets 25 20 and 25 20. Skywalkers, thanks to Liberman Algamez and his game high 24 points, never look back in this match as they take the third set 28 26 and a 3 0 win. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs.
Okay, time now to check in on the weather conditions in Korea and around the world. And that's all for now. Thanks ever so much for joining us. We'll be back at noon Korea time. But in the meantime, you can always catch up with what's been happening on our website, which can be found at arirang.co.kr forward slash news.